Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to another episode of Adventures in Angular. Today, we have uh, Aaron Frost, your host. I work with Hero Devs and with ng-conf. And on the panel, we have Joseph Eames. Hello. I also refer to myself in the third person. Joseph Eames here and uh, CEO of Thinkster. Happy to be here. We have Jennifer Wadella. Do I have to say something witty and in the third person? Third person is optional. Witty. We already knew you were witty. Okay. Yeah, witty required. Okay. Well, I am a JavaScript developer at a consulting company called Batovi, and we'll make fun of Aaron as much as I can. Why are you talking about the kombucha? I thought you were Wait, I, I will tank the whole podcast just to talk about kombucha. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually just bottled a new batch, and it's extra fermented and pineapple serrano flavored. Pineapple serrano? Oh, yeah. Like, I gave it to my one of my girlfriend's, like, husband, and he, like, spat it out his nose because he wasn't prepared for the spice. It was hilarious. Wow, that's amazing. That sounds really good. And then uh, we have a special guest today. He, uh, he comes from us from San Jose area, Mountain View area. His name's Alex Eagle, and he's from the Angular team. He works on CLI. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Alex, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, Alex Eagle is a uh, third person. Can I use the royal we? Is that confusing? That might be confusing, especially yeah, not totally English good. language. Good. Yeah, so we uh, work on the Angular CLI team. Yeah, I've been at Google for over 10 years. I've been working on Angular for like four and a half years and um, recently working mostly on build, build and test developer tooling kind of stuff. So I've been leading CLI for the last uh, six months or so and um, I've been working on Bazel for a couple of years, which I think we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io. So I tweeted last night that you need to be wary of people that have first names for last names. Is Eagle a first name? I was really tempted to reply to that last night and say, like, like this, this seems unkind to someone. And of course, James Henry, poor guy. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't feel like I had anything to contribute to that thread. As far as I know, Eagle is only a last name. Eagle's only a last It's a pretty cool nickname, though. It could be a first name, is all I'm saying. People may need to be wary of you. You're, you're in the gray area, right? It's a title. It's not a first or last name. It's a title. Alex, the Eagle. The Eagle. Mm-hmm. Esquire, the third. Yep. So, Alex, we've been hearing about Basil for less time than we've been hearing about Ivy, but still a long time. Yeah. We all know Ivy fixes everything, but Basil fixes a couple other things. So, so talk, what's kind of the state of Basil right, right now? So the state of it is we launched an opt-in preview at ng-conf, which is coincidentally the same thing that Ivy is in. So yeah, we have these two big efforts that are both at a similar stage in their, in their, in their life cycle, which is that they're big disruptive changes. Well, disruptive in terms of there's a lot changing in Angular. Obviously, both of these we want to land without disruption for users. And so the hard thing is to go th- like to vet whether whether it works for everybody's applications before we try to roll it out widely. So that's true for Ivy and we're try- we've we've asked people to opt into Ivy and tell us if it breaks your app. For Bazel, it's similarly possible to opt in and use Bazel today, but I think, you know, what we'll spend most of our time talking about is what why would you want to do that? Ivy as you said, like there's this perception that it it does it does solve a bunch of things and it also unlocks our team to be able to do a bunch of things. Bazel is, is solving a more specific problem which is Largely enterprise scale, building really big apps with lots of engineers um, and lots of lots of code. What's your elevator pitch? Why should we w- opt in today? So I think the elevator pitch is mostly directed at people who have a specific problem. 
And so if you don't have that problem, then I don't necessarily want to get everybody to use a thing that um, adds you know, a risk for you and doesn't, doesn't have upside. So the upside is that Bazel is a different approach to how to orchestrate all of the work that needs to happen when you run your build and test. And it decouples all of the different tools in a way that is sort of like the Unix philosophy. It is like each of these tools can be run independently. And then we just need a like, an equivalent of the Unix pipe, which lets me take standard output of one tool and put it into standard input of the next. So that means the, ele- I mean, the elevator pitch is really, we want to make your build and test a lot faster. And we think that this is an area where the CLI hasn't been really strong for, for big enterprise apps. This isn't a problem we've tried to solve in the past. So this is us trying to solve that problem. So currently I make a new Angular project, right? And then me and my, me and my workmates, we build on it for six months, a year, a couple years. And under the covers the whole time, Webpack's kind of got my back. And it, uh, it just kind of does everything I needed to do. Like, I, I have no idea what's behind the curtains with the CLI, right? Now, eventually, the Angular team may try and just, like, swap that Webpack to, for Bazel for me. But what are kind of the triggers that, like, I would look for to say, I might need to consider Bazel. Like, I might need to proactively look for Bazel rather than just waiting for the CLI to force it on me. What are... What are some of those triggers that, you know, the everyday developer, the everyday Angular developer can be looking for to, to, to know when, when it's time to start watching Alex Eagle's conference talks? Before I answer, one quick clarification. We have to be, I want to be clear that Bazel doesn't replace Webpack. Like you can totally run Webpack under Bazel. Like I think the mental model is a little more subtle where Webpack is kind of doing a couple of jobs and we just want Bazel to do one of those jobs. Totally still makes sense to use Webpack. Um, totally possible to like have a Webpack config, and um, there are a lot of options, right, for how to run your tools. Webpack can still be one of them. Okay. Um, so what, what? Yeah. What are the triggers? How do you know that you need this thing? So it's really that there are a few of them. One is that you are operating at such a large scale that your CI takes like an hour, and like it takes way too long to run all of your tests. Or it could be that you're running locally, and when you do a production build, it takes over 15 minutes. And so you're like completely unproductive if you need to debug something that's only that only shows up in the prod build. Another trigger is that uh, is a little more organizational. How do you interact with other teams around you? So if you're doing micro front ends, how do you test that your your Angular app will work when somebody else is either they're dynamically loading some stuff into the same page or you have totally separate SPAs, like you actually do a, a server round trip between apps, but you're passing information in like the URL parameters. How do you test that the whole system is going to work? So if you want to be able to integrate your software across multiple apps, then Bazel helps with that. Also, if you want to work more closely with your backend team, where you find a lot of defects in production because you weren't able to integrate the front end and backend inside of all of your integration tests, then you want to build a system that understands the full stack. And so you have a problem that's bigger than just Angular. You're like, well, I have a Java backend or a C-sharp backend. And when I make changes there, I want to be able to verify that the front end still works. So now you want a build tool that understands that's, you know, a bigger, it's solving a bigger problem for, for, the, for the entire ecosystem and not just for your front end. So those are subtle, right? I think if, if you think of like, I just do Angular, my team writes an Angular app. Um, yes, Webpack has my back today. You're fine. And you should definitely not watch my conference talks unless, you know, you're just like a build system geek. Um, so yeah. speaking of your conference talks, um, for anybody who is not privileged enough to see your talk at NGConf, can you maybe explain a little bit more about like what it means to be a build tool versus a dev tool versus CI? Like you mentioned it not replacing Webpack. Can you go a little bit more in depth into explaining that? Yeah, thanks. That's a good one. So I think for a lot of people, these things get kind of confused. Like we sent out a survey saying, what build tool do you use today? And I got a lot of responses, which was Jenkins. So Jenkins is a continuous integration that's just, you know, it schedules. So it like watches for changes to your repo, or you can have it be like a cron that schedules periodically. And then it just runs whatever you say is your build tool. So you like it runs some program. Then later you need to, like at the other end of the stack, you need to do specific transformations to your code. You need to like run the TypeScript compiler to to convert it to JavaScript. You need to run SAS to do your CSS preprocessing. You need to run Webpack or Rollup to bundle things together into fewer files. So in the middle of those two things is, okay, so the build needs to happen, like the CI has, has triggered, and there are all these different steps that I need to do, like run TypeScript and run SAS. So then I want something that I would call a build system. You can think of it as like orchestrating the build. And that's a layer that can be a layer in the middle that is independent of like what CI you use, and it's also independent of what tools you use. And I think the reason this is really confusing in JavaScript today 
is that we used to have Grunt and then we had Gulp, and those were those fit this middle of the stack. They didn't know how to do a particular transformation. But then the sort of replacement of, of Gulp was, okay, pick Webpack or Rollup or you know, a, a different, like, a, a, like I think Cypress has plugins for these different things. Basically, you pick one workflow tool, and then its job is to have plugins to go and do all of the individual transforms. So, so Bazel, you can think of as being like the next in the lineage after Gulp, as opposed to replacing a bundler or a test, a test runner um, or a dev server. So it doesn't replace like a bundler. And I current, we currently, we use the CLI as a bundler, right? We use it as a generator, like a Yeoman generator, and then we use it for other tools. And then for the build step, we, you know, it, it leverages Webpack for its bundler features, right? Mm-hmm. I understand that one day I may be able to like opt into a version of the CLI that um, it will kind of, you'll kind of do all the, all the things that Webpack does for me already. You guys will kind of autom- you will automate the Bazel doing that for me. Like you'll kind of, you'll kind of ship it with a bunch of predefined tasks that it knows how to do. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So it's conceivable, it, it, it's feasible to say one day I'll show up at work, I'll do an NPM install, and then my build is actually using Bazel that day. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so, Bazel is distributed on NPM, so just like you could have had Gulp in your package JSON, and you know you run NPM build, NPM run serve, whatever. The workflow for a developer on your team doesn't change. So either the either the CLI does everything for you, and and nobody on your team has to do anything, which is sort of the end vision. We'll see if we ever really get to a point where it's it's a full like zero effort drop in replacement. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly in the meantime, some opt in effort required. We can talk about like, what the effort is. And even there, only somebody on your team who's aware of like, like imagine there's somebody today who like is into Webpack config and what they're doing. And most people on your team don't ever touch that because it's scary and it breaks things. Yeah. Like, model, like you have somebody who, who can, who digs a level deeper into the build and like, yeah, so that's the person who's changing how your build works. And everybody else on the team should be completely unaware that that's happening. So with Bazel being on NPM and it, it trying to kind of be the, the next step of like a gun, a grunt or a gulp. With like grunt and gulp, we had these other NPM packages like I could have grunt um, Babel or like it, it, that, that grunt Babel was like a, a Babel, a grunt plugin that would do Babel stuff for me, right? Or I could have, um, I, had, I had all these grunt and gulp plugins that kind of were already kind of configured to do their thing inside of the grunt or gulp ecosphere. Is Bazel having a lot of that same plugin system or is that not really a thing? Or like, how does nope. the- That's actually totally identical. Totally same, same mental model. In our case, uh, we followed what uh, TypeScript did. So if you have some NPM package, let's say, you know, banana, then you would look for at types slash banana would be the name of the NPM package that gives you the typings, right? Yep. Um, and then some packages ship, like are, are written in TypeScript. And so they ship the typings inside of the package. And so you don't need anything extra. Right? You just get the package and it's all built in. Yeah. A model is at types. So if you had a package called banana, you would use at basil slash banana to get the plugin. Okay. It must be lunchtime here. I don't know why I'm thinking about bananas. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my husband and I just started playing the new Donkey Kong, so that was making me laugh. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about barrels too, although that's kind of confusing. Ooh. And similarly, if you had a package that was built with basil, then it could just be that it distributes basil files in it and you don't need any separate sidecar package. So another way to describe this, um, also new back to my ng-conf talk, is Gulp, Grunt, and Bazel are all kind of this hub and spoke model where you have one like orchestration tool and it needs one plugin for each test runner or like transpiler. Like every one of the tools in your toolbox is plugged into this orchestrator. And so, you know, so you imagine this is the third, like if there's Gulp, Grunt, and Bazel are the three, then you have three times however many tools is how many plugins need to be written. Compare that with what's what you have when each tool becomes a monolith and needs to understand the whole ecosystem. Then you have an M by N matrix where you have each all the columns are all the tools in your toolbox, and all the rows are all of the end user like workflow tools. So like I need a Cypress TypeScript plugin and I need a Webpack TypeScript plugin, or I need Cypress to run Webpack. If I'm using Rollup, then I need a Rollup TypeScript plugin. And so you can imagine one 
one column is TypeScript. And then for every tool that you use, there's a row where you, like, you have to plug TypeScript into that tool. Then you have to plug SAS into that tool. And so you just end up with this much bigger space of like the plugin might not exist. Like maybe there's no like rollup. I know like rollup and view, for example, I was recently looking at how view is hooked up. Like there's a rollup view plugin, but it's kind of like not supported as much as the view plugin for Webpack is. Seems like, you know, here I'm not the expert about it at all, but like the fact that you need to go through all of the tools and fill in this box is a problem. And then you end up depending on so many different contributors for so many open source projects. And like, it's awesome that, that open source and JavaScript in particular is this bizarre model of like many, many people building things. But it's, it's harder to get like one tool chain that actually works end to end when there's so many different things to coordinate. So I think this is, this is part of sort of, this, is, this doesn't make you as a developer do anything different, but I think as tooling authors in the ecosystem, we should be thinking about like building all of these monoliths means that it's really hard to make a new tool because you have to plug it into all the workflow stuff, or it's really hard to make a new workflow thing. Like if you want to make a new bundler, you'd have to write plugins for every tool. And so we've kind of gotten into a point where everything works with Webpack. That's great. Like there's nothing wrong with using Webpack, right? But does everything work with Rollup? Well, I don't know, maybe not everything. And then like you write a whole new test runner, like how are you going to do all the transpilers for your new test runner? And so it means that we don't have as much innovation because there's such a barrier to making a new thing to plug it into everything else in the ecosystem. So this goes back to this Unix philosophy. They're like, well, it seems like you should just be able to publish your tool and then it should be able to work with other people's tools without having to, like there should be a, a standard sort of, you know, in, in the case of Unix, it's like text files with line endings. That's the, that's the protocol that the different tools speak with each other. And then there's, they're composable and you don't have to have a monolithic tool that understands cut and sed and awk and everything built in. I could rant about that forever. How long do we have? <laughs> well, actually, um, I kind of wanted to go back to Aaron's question, talking about um, triggers and looking out, because I feel like in the enterprise world, like a lot of times this stuff can creep up on you, like a, a frog, um, not in boiling water, but like slowly being brought to boil water where things just get a little bit slower and a little bit longer as they grow. Like, do you have any good horror stories of like people that have really pushed the max or like at what point would you go in and, and see something that, that Basil is trying to solve and would like walk into a code base and just start crying at the compile time. Yeah. Frog, frog in a, in a boiling pot is totally the right metaphor. Um, I mean, I think we've probably all seen this on our projects. Um, like even a small project, like things get kind of get slower over time and there's a certain amount of effort that you put in to keep your development process fast. And, you know, it's hard to get a big company to fund developer infrastructure and developer productivity. And I think it's something as developers, we're all trying to find like, some spare time or like somebody on our team who's especially gullible who will help to do this stuff and like keep us all working. And yeah, that's, that's, that sucks. Like, I think there are certain inflection points where you notice that it's happening. And probably one of them is you need to go into the CLI and like change the max heap size for node. And then you, and then you have some developers who are like, Oh, I don't have 16 gigs of Ram on my laptop. And you're like, well, okay, everybody's getting a new laptop. If you want to do a production build. And so like there, there are certain points where it's especially obvious that that's happening, but yeah, I agree that it's, it's hard to, Basil is just, is just one of many things where we want to keep ourselves productive. And as we scale up, it becomes, it becomes hard to do. A lot of the enterprises we talk to are interested in monorepos right now because it's hard to, I mean, it's just something that's going on in the industry. We can talk about that as its own topic. That's a big investment in keeping yourself productive. Like once you start using a monorepo, it's another reflection point where you realize, oh, if I don't have a build tool that, can, that understands all the software in here, then how do I build all the things in this monorepo? Hmm. So... I'm looking at Bazel and like as a, as a, as a, as kind of an experienced engineer, I hear people describe it and the descriptions get a little like, I like, I kind of like go, Oh, cause people are like, Hey, you can run your build across 40 cloud servers. And I'm like, what, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of build needs to involve the cloud? Like that sounds crazy. That sounds scary to me that like, um, I need to spin up some EC2 instances just to run my build. You know, like it makes me nervous. So like explain the power, explain where you're trying to take us. Cause it sounds, I realize there's some immense power. I know that your team, your build went from an hour to like seven minutes. So I know that it's got huge potential. I'm just yeah. trying to um, understand some of the scary edges that I hear about. I'm like, uh, I'm not ready for that. That sounds way too cool for like what I'm doing. By the way, uh, we talked about testing earlier, so Joe Joe uh, left the the podcast because he hates that stuff. Yeah, but he's back now. Joe's back. So the good thing we are not talking about testing anymore. I don't want to talk about it. 
Yeah. Okay. I was, I was about to answer your question with with mentions of testing. Okay. No. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Answer. 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 Answer my question. Okay. I feel like this is giving me a second shot at uh, Jennifer's earlier question. What's the elevator pitch? Because I was like, ah, oh, I don't want people to use this. Okay. Here's here's the vision for how how awesome this can all be. As your software grows and you have a big monorepo, and I make a change somewhere, and I want to be like, does everything still work? Right. And if I have integration tests, that's really cool because now I can be like, okay, I, if I run all the integration tests, I'm really confident that when I ship this, like everything is like the whole system works all together. And as I write more integration tests, I have more engineers on my project and there's more, you know, like software does nothing but grow, right? And so like eventually over time, the amount of CPU, the amount of resources I need to do builds and tests grows. And eventually we hit this limit where we say, okay, well, we're not willing to wait that long. Like we could get a big beefy machine to do our build or like I can get a faster laptop. And eventually I get to a point where it just doesn't feel fast enough. And like the, the obvious thing to do is, okay, well, you're just trying to do too much work. So don't run all the tests every time you make a change. Don't run the front end integration tests when you change the back end or you change like the data schema that is used uh, for the, you know, the protocol that the services in the front end are using to talk to the back end. Like no, nobody's got resources to run all those tests. Like why even try? And so then we end up with every team is on their own little island and they're running a continuous build, which they call continuous integration, but they're not integrating their software with the other teams. So it's not really integration anymore. I think we've kind of gotten in this false mindset where we're doing CI, but everybody does their own little CI for their own piece of the world. And it's only later when we go to ship that like hopefully during like, you know, we have some period where we're doing manual testing and we discover bugs or else they go to production. And then we're like, oh, like the version X of this thing didn't work with the version Y of that thing. Like, you know, and we're like, oh, well, could we have written an integration test for that? If you think in a postmortem sense, like what could we have done? You're like, well, we could write a whole bunch of integration tests across the whole stack and run them every time we make a change. And then you're back to like, okay, well now our build is way too slow. So really the vision is like, I want both. I want to be able to like, every time I make a change, I want to be like, yeah, test my change. And pretty quickly from like most kinds of changes, I should get feedback that says everything in the whole system still works. Like you can ship to prod and there won't be any integration failures between back end and the front end or between different micro front ends or like however you divide up your work. So, okay, so let's, let's still drill into that a little bit. So, okay, so I, I just said, I want to rerun all the tests when I made a little change. So first of all, I don't want to actually re-execute all the tests. First, I want there to be something, you can kind of imagine it's like change detection in Angular. Like something was changed and now I need to re-render the view and I don't want to like recreate all the DOM. And this is getting into too much you know, tech detail, but like this is what Angular does under the covers is it does this algorithm to figure out, okay, based on what just changed, what could, do I need to re-render? And what we're talking about in the build system is totally equivalent. Based on the source code file you just changed, what tests possibly need to be rerun? So one of the things we have, one of the things Bazel needs in order to solve our problems is it has to understand this dependency graph. And so you know, we can talk about how it understands that dependency graph. But assuming it knows the graph, then it can figure out, okay, these are the only things that are possibly need to be rerun. The second thing is it could say, okay, so now something needs to be rerun, but let me look at all of the inputs for each step in the build. And if the inputs haven't changed, Bazel assumes that it doesn't need to rerun that thing. And so there are a lot of, there's, there's a lot of cases where, you know, you change a comment and then downstream in your JavaScript, you've stripped all the comments, let's say. So then the inputs to the test are not changed because you changed this comment. And so the test doesn't need to rerun. And this is incrementality. And so Bazel has like really good incrementality properties of only needs to rerun certain things. And it can assume based on the inputs exactly what work needs to happen, right? That's a good fancy word too, incrementality. Yeah, Yeah. incremental. I mean, we all kind of know that like, I made this little change. I don't want to rerun all the integration tests in the world, except the one integration test that actually would have caught the problem I just introduced, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's as cool as transclusion, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's no transclusion in Bazel, don't worry. Okay. Okay, so now, so there's, there's two, two, more, two more steps along this journey. Okay, so now something does need to rerun, right? One of my inputs, one of my JavaScript files is different, and so the test needs to execute. But it turns out my coworker already ran the same build, and they had the same change. Or maybe the CI already ran, and it had the same change. Maybe I, like, pushed a commit, and so the, you know, it was doing a, pre, a pre-submit run on my CI. So... If anybody, if my, one of my coworkers or my CI has already done this exact build with exactly the same inputs, then Bazel can use a cache. And so now I can cache the build artifacts, the intermediate build artifacts, right? Like the steps in between TypeScript and Webpack, let's say. Those can be cached, so I don't need to rerun that step if anybody else has already run it with identical inputs. 
So that's cool. It means even like if my CI is up to date and I and I sync to to head and I rerun the build, I should mostly be getting caches. And so I can have incrementality even in a case where you would imagine you'd normally get a really cold build. So that's that's step two of the the, the pitch. So step three is okay. I changed something and I don't get caches. Like I just like updated the version of Angular in my project, and so everything is affected by that. Right, you look at the dependency graph, and you're like, okay, all my components, all my ng modules, like everything depends on the version of Angular, and I didn't have this on CI yet. So now I actually do have a bunch of work to do. Like I have to do the big build, I have to run all the integration tests. I don't have enough compute on my laptop to do that. So this is where I want to just throw a bunch of CPUs at this problem. And so Bazel, since it understands all of the inputs for each step that needs to run, it can just upload those inputs somewhere else where there's enough available CPU, and it can farm out the build. So it can parallelize. If there's 20 things that could be happening in parallel, I can get 20 machines to do those things. And so not only am I not constrained anymore by like, you know, in Node, it's hard to even use all the CPUs on your machine because JavaScript is a single thread and like single process, I should say. Although Node now has this worker threads API that's pretty new. And so like you can kind of farm out things to the rest of the CPUs on your machine. But like what we really want is I just want to throw like 150 CPUs at it. And so now we finally get back to what Frosty said earlier, like, yeah, on Angular, when we threw 150 machines at our CI, it went down like 87%, right? It went from 60 minutes to seven and a half or something because, because we were willing to like throw machines at it, right? And cloud is getting cheaper all the time and buying laptops for all your engineers can't possibly scale to what the cloud can do. You're saying that the key there is that determination. It's not so much that it inherently increases the speed, but it lets you either decide one, only rerun a small set of the tests that need to be run, mm -hmm. right? Or make the determination a large set of tests need to be run. So does that mean that it's possible to decide somehow the computer gets to decide, you know, or the system somewhere, Bazel is deciding, hey, I only need to run a small set. I can run those locally versus I need to run a longer set. I'm going to send those up. Is there like some criteria there? Or is it more like, hey, because it knows and it kicks off, you know, some 87 minute process on my machine versus normally it's kicking off a 30 second process. And somehow I did the magic change that cascaded across so many pieces that we have to rerun the whole entire thing. Is that what we're talking about here or? Yeah. So what you're getting at is that once we decide we have to do one of the steps in the build. And when you say we, when we decide who's we, the basil, right? Right. Yes. You, you, you made changes to your inputs. And so some number of the build steps need to be rerun executing tests and tests are great to parallelize like most of our tests don't depend on each other right so right if they do uh, uh, that you and i need to have a talk yeah exactly so if if the test needs to be rerun then then yeah basil can decide should i schedule it locally do i have plenty of cpus locally do i need to run it remote and yeah it depends on sort of the width of the graph so if there's a lot of things to parallelize then it's worth it to take the extra latency hit of uploading my inputs to the cloud and then downloading the the resulting build artifact. Whereas if my if I'm if I'm doing an incremental build, then my local C, my local resources are sufficient for the build steps that I'm running. And so yeah, Bazel will like just parallelize the work over your local CPUs. And one thing I really like about Bazel is that that scheduling algorithm is totally independent of how you express your build and how the build executes. Right. And so Bazel is making new releases, like in in the the release that just came out this week it automatically tries to keep compilers warm. And so like the TypeScript compiler, we can keep it running. And so we don't have to pay the cost of like a new node process. It's the same thing as TSC-watch. Like you run a compiler running in a watch mode. And so Bazel is able to do things like that to, um, to assuming that, you're, that, you've, that your Bazel plugin for the compiler knows how to keep the compiler running, then Bazel can schedule like, okay, well, I'll just keep four copies of the compiler alive so that I have much less latency when I send it work to get a to like kick off a TypeScript compile, so yeah, this is a, this is totally inside stuff. Like as a user, you don't care, but Bazel can be smarter about the heuristics for where to do the build to to handle this trade off between do I have enough resources and what's the latency of using a, a farm of of remote build workers. That sounds like the kind of magic that turns into a disaster when you try to like. I hear people talking about. Have, I've heard before people talking about some kind of thing that's like, hey, we can make this happen like this. And then when you go to the, do the details, you realize, oh my gosh, this is like five times more complex and ridiculous and I can't get this configured correctly because I mean, I'm just trying to think through the process of, it makes a decision that you've changed enough inputs that your local, you know, one, understanding your local machine and the power that it has available, right? 
And then two, understanding how to send that up to your CI system in the cloud and say, no, no, kick this off on the cloud. And then, you know, like I understand the process of what it's like when I'm on a developer and I'm on my box and I've got a set of CI tests and I go change something and those tests need to rerun. Sometimes those tests take forever and sometimes they don't. And if Basil incrementally says, hey, I don't, need to run all the tests, we only run the small set, then whew, thank goodness this test run is only taking me 20 seconds. Whereas if I have to run the whole test run, it takes me 90 minutes, right? But the minute that you make the decision of, oh my gosh, you know, or analyzing what's on the machine and saying this has to go somewhere else, and I think, oh my gosh, that either is, it's either crazy m- magic or snake oil. <laughs> so... It's and not big, coming from you, it sounds like, it, it, I, my, my opinion is it's, it's got to be magic, right? Because I know you, but uh, that's, it's just, it just sounds amazingly whacked. That's, that's, that's the best word. That's whacked. <laughs> Let me offer an existence proof that somebody does it this way, which is, you know, we haven't pointed out yet on this podcast, but like we always say this at every GenjiCon. Google does it this way, right? This is how we develop the biggest apps at Google it's by having thousands of machines. And I used to be the tech lead for our continuous build system. And at that time, it was like tens of thousands of machines. I don't know what it is now. I'm probably not even supposed to say if I did know, but like lots of like resources in production data. Hey, you say that number, say it. <laughs> I would be guessing. So maybe it's fine for me to guess. It's got to be like over 100K machines. Hmm. But you know, I mean, you divide that by how many engineers work at Google. So like, yeah, you have a few machines per person, basically. Like we bought you a laptop and we have like, you know, three machines in the data center your builds. That's reasonable, right? So yeah, so like we 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 do this and yeah, it's it's there's a lot of complexity in making it work. And so yeah, it sounds kind of scary. Like how do you decide to run local or remote? So first of all, this is not something users care about, right? Like right. the user does is say like I have a directory of TypeScript files here. Like that's all you say to be and you say, oh and it depends on this other directory over there. And I know um, Aaron's gonna ask about this dependency graph thing. As a user, like as long as Bazel knows dependency graph, it, it knows what to do, right? As right. a Author, when I wrote the, when we write the TypeScript compiler plugin for Bazel, there's a couple of things we have to do. But it's basically we have to be careful that the only things we need are the things that we told Bazel we're going to use, and that we don't rely on like local pass on the disk because the thing could run somewhere else. So when you're writing one of these, you have to follow some basic rules about being hermetic, meaning like you only depend on the things you declared, right? Right. right. And and so then like when Bazel lays out your thing on some other machine, it's like in some different directory. But your, your TypeScript config, your TS config file is there on disk, and all your t- TypeScript inputs are there on disk, and your DTS files are there on disk. Or in the TypeScript compiler, you tell Bazel where the outputs go, and then it downloads them back. So as a, as a plugin author, you have to f- declare all the inputs, declare all the outputs, and be, um, and be hermetic about how you operate. And you also should be deterministic. You should make sure, given the same inputs, I produce the same output so that the caching can work right. Because you don't want to like pollute the cache because then you'll cause a bunch of rebuilds that shouldn't happen. Right. Hey, are you working on a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. They update the class regularly for the most current Angular, and a lot of the curriculum is also relevant to older versions. Or you can go beyond the three-day class with help from Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. They can assist your team or launch your project, including scalability, data flow, state management, service architecture, full stack product design, and a ton more. Or you can contact them for a private class at your location or attend public classes in cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. So one of the things that I think is universally true is if it's a good idea for Facebook or Google to do something, then every company in the world should do something. That's universal. It's universally true, right? Yeah, like, it's universal. You just yeah. made a fact. I did. I'm pretty sure I stated a. I or made a fact. You're right. Mm-hmm. I made a fact. I made it. That's that's the fact I made. You heard it here first, folks. But yeah, right. So when I see what Facebook is doing with their development, obviously that's what every company in the world needs to do for their development. When I see that Google's using Bazel, like I'm in a startup right now. We have a quarter time developer, literally 20 hours a month. That's what we have for development. So he, I should be turning him on to Basil, getting him, that's his next project, is implementing Basil. Yeah. Right? Did you do it yet? <laughs> that, that, doesn't, that does not sound right. I'm pretty sure you want that person to develop code that's useful for you. Yeah, there's a, there's a scale question. I think uh, the only startups I see who, are, who, who get started with this sort of scalable build infrastructure are ones where somebody left 
Google or Facebook and is like, oh, I just want to have the same thing I'm used to from day one and like set that up, right? So somebody who just has that proclivity or like they have the experience doing it and they're like, hey, everybody on the team, I just quit Google. And so like, here's Basil, like you're welcome. We talked earlier on about like criteria, things you should look for. And you said a really long build time was like the number one criteria you should look for to say, hey, it's yeah. time. So you're at a company, your build time is obviously maybe something at least north of 20 minutes, right? Your, your CI time is at least north of 20 minutes, maybe, maybe more if I'm running on a single machine. That's time to start thinking. What about another criteria I think is still useful? Like I could be a solo developer and end up with a 60 minute, but I'm, 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 I'm having a tough time imagining actually getting to that point, but I think it's possible that there's, a, there's some place where there's a solo developer with a 60 minute CI time, right? If you're a solo developer, is that kind of that criteria that like, yeah, you probably don't want to spend the resources it's going to take to implement? Or is, it going to, is that like ROI going to be pretty reasonable that even if you're solo, and you're got to do all the basal implementation work yourself. It, it sounds like I'm going to I'm going to guess, I'm guessing. It sounds like because it's like um functional and if the input's the same, it doesn't rerun that step. It could still be massively time savings for one person still. I think the answer is yes, there are cases where a solo developer would want it, but I don't think it's for build time. I think I think Joe is right, like it's hard to imagine like writing enough code that it takes an hour to execute like your your build and test. As a single, like you need, you need millions of lines of code, right? I was imagining somebody who's super into end, end tests and just like went nuts about it, right? Like I'm writing an end, I'm like doing BDD, I'm writing end to end tests for every piece of functionality, right? And I end up with a thousand end to end tests on my 20,000 lines of code, right? Yeah, may, maybe. I mean, even there, like you're, you should Probably find where the test fixture come up faster, even if it's a, a separate topic. Right. No, but so like, I'm just thinking to answer the question, like if I was doing a small project, would I start with Bazel? And I do actually, and there are a couple of reasons. One is that I can do full stack. I can like everything like, you know, I'm, I'm not just writing an Angular front end unless I'm like, you know, using somebody's API, like I'm just talking to GitHub API or something, right? And it's just like a pure front end project. So I need to like, I'm building more than just TypeScript code. The other reason is that the way you put your build together is, is composable. But I can like drop in like, oh, I need one of these, I need one of those. Like I'm going to have a TypeScript library that's an input to a, a bundler step. The way you express the configuration is just really ergonomic. And so if you've already, like if you learned Bazel already, then it takes, it, it's a lot less time to set up your, your, your tool chain and like keep it up to date, basically. I don't know that that's a reason that you would, that you would want to spend the time to learn Bazel necessarily. Like, you know, you can probably get other options off the shelf. And I guess it kind of depends on how custom your build is. Like if you're, if you're, if Angular CLI does exactly what you need, then you're done, right? And if somebody else's tool chain does exactly what you need, that's fine. I think it's, um, it's really, you know, at, at Google, every build is a snowflake and everybody needs to customize what it does. And if we said, even the Angular CLI internally at Google, we mostly use it for scaffolding files. Um, and then people edit the build configurations by hand. It's not now, the same way it does external. Are the builds snowflakes because they're beautiful or because they're delicate or because if there's, a, there's enough of them that you get buried under them and you, you drown and, and suffocate? I think it's because that each one is different. I think that's why you say snowflake. But you, I think your, your other analogies are actually pretty good too. I think are regardless, awesome? you have a new talk title, so. <laughs> that, is a, that would be an awesome talk title, wouldn't it? Oh. Alex, I got a question. So the Angular team, they go through this big effort they reduce their build internally at Google from 60 minutes to seven or eight, right? How does that positively affect your team? Like, I don't, I don't know how it was negatively affecting you. Can you kind of spell out to some people, this is how we benefited from that type of a savings? Because some people might have a yeah. hard time understanding. I don't care if it takes an hour or eight minutes. So the first one is nothing is worse than you push a PR and then like you get in the car and you're like, oh, like, or sorry, you push the PR and you're around for a few minutes and you're like, okay, like it's running, that's cool. And then you leave and you switch context. And then like an hour later, it was read because of some dumb test that you could have like, you could have fixed that in the same loop, right? So like losing a development round trip or you're sitting there in your machine and you're like, this has to be green and it has to merge before I go home. Let me sit here for an extra hour and wait to see if it's green. Yep. That's only for the Angular team. Like, you know, we're working on lots of things at once. And so we're pushing snapshots, you know, we're pushing commits to our PRs and like, like a faster round trip just allows you to do things in real time that you would otherwise have to like, you know, context switch out and in. So there's a real productivity boost. The other thing is uh, Igor has claimed, Igor is the, the illustrious leader of, of Angular. He's, he's, his feeling is that 
by introducing Bazel, we're now like getting a jillion more PRs through the project. And so really it was like scaling up our ability to pump changes through this thing. And Angular itself is like a big monorepo. It's a pretty good example. If you send us a PR and you watch like, you know, Angular uses Circle CI, but then you look at the Circle CI jobs and like a, jillion, a bunch of them spin up and then the Bazel one spins up and there's like, there's a lot of testing to do when you make a change. And we really want to get that feedback on a PR. So the other thing for us is that we know when we merge things that all of our integration tests are passing for everybody's PR, for every commit that we push to a PR. And if we weren't using Bazel, I think we wouldn't be able to keep up on our CI anymore. And then we would be making the trade-off I described earlier where we'd be like, well, we'll run the test in the directory that you changed. And then like sometime later, we'll find out whether everything still works. And then, and then like, I don't know how we would ever ship Angular. Like we release on green. It's like, we really like our CI is trustworthy and we run it all the time. There's something I want to make sure I, 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 I say before uh, we get into other questions, because I, I, I noticed like uh, Aaron's, Aaron's question in our, in our chat here about like, how do you create this, all these cloud servers? What does it look like when we actually opted into RBE? We flipped a setting in Bazel. So we said like dash dash config equals remote. And then we signed up for a service that is on Google Cloud called Remote Build Execution. And so I'm actually partnering a lot with that team as they're onboarding. They started onboarding some Angular enterprises already. They manage this whole swarm of machines for you. So, and they do all the elasticity of making sure you're not being billed when you're not doing builds. And like, like yeah, so you, you're, not, you're not going on Amazon EC2 and like provisioning like, you know, your own Kubernetes cluster of build workers. Like, no, you just, you just turn on a flag and you give Google Cloud your credit card. And so, like you can run one of these on-premises, like there are open source versions of it, but I think for most people, it's just, it's way more effective to just use a cloud service that already does it. So I don't have to learn Kubernetes and Docker in order to, to use Bazel. Like that's, that, that's my concern. I'm like, yeah, Dan, no, I don't no, wanna... no, you should, you should learn those so you can be friends with Dan Walleen and uh, yeah. you can get more jobs that way. There's lots of, Kubernetes and, and Docker are awesome and they actually do have tie-ins with Bazel that, you know, if that's your thing, like we can discuss how those, how, how, the, how that kind of deployment and that kind of target environment, um, you can do those builds under Bazel too. But no, like we have a service that does this. Everybody should check out, if you go to bazel.angular.io, uh, which I guess we should put in the show notes, like this is the one place to go. The first thing under resources is a link to this remote build execution service. Okay, so I'm, I'm currently working with a team where there's 30 developers and uh, I'm trying to understand the words you're saying and apply it to the, like this team. Just... Yeah, I do this anytime I'm listening to podcasts and I'm listening to you, I'm like, all right, hello, how does this apply to me? So like, let's say I'm on the team with these 30, with these 30 folks and a uh, person like way over on their side of the room, they changed some file, right? And that, and that, so do I run this at dev time? And then that puts like, pushes like the, I can't remember what you called it, the the output, the- the yeah. um, intermediate build artifact. Yeah, the inter, the I- B A. It pushes the IBA out to some like team build process that uh, Google provisioned for me because I used the link you just told us to go to. And then next time I make a commit, it doesn't have to do that step because it did that step when he, when that person, sorry, he or she, when they did it, it did it then. And so my build's faster because, am I understanding it right? Like my my current build's faster because when they made the change on their machine that IBA got pushed out at that time, and then all builds that need that in the future are faster. Explain yes. it to understand it. Yes, that, that is correct. You can share those build artifacts with your coworkers, so you don't have to redo work that's identical to work they already did. So if there's 30 of us, and we're all sharing the same, and I'm not even like building, I'm just doing like, I'm in dev mode. I, it's not even pushed out to a server. I, can my reloads really be like, instant just because we're all sharing the same IVAs? Like, is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the important use case to think about is like, you come in in the morning and you do your first like, you know, ng serve, mm -hmm. like after you sync to head, mm -hmm. have to compile all the TypeScript and run all the SAS and like, you know, like splitting and whatever else is, is in, the, in the critical path to bring your local server up. Mm -hmm. and, and all those steps should be cache hits because it's like somebody already did it before you got in or the CI already did it. And Bazel will just be like, Oi, uh, I'm just, I'm just using the, uh, the thing in the, in the remote build server thing that you guys all share now. Yeah. I mean, the simple thing actually is you can set up a cache in your office and it's just a web dev server. So like, forget about the remote execution part. Let's say your like execution always happens here on your laptop because it's much simpler to set up. 
mm-hmm. just a web dev server with like a you know like an, a fast solid state disk or something, and like you all point to it, and yeah, now you can share those you can share build artifacts with your coworkers. So I'm going to come back to uh, a different question that Joe asked earlier because it sounds like maybe the answer is even if my build doesn't take an hour, it still sounds really beneficial because with the CLI, I've seen times where, or just with Webpack in general, I've seen times where I make one file change and it's like 20 seconds to recompile and refresh my page to make sure nothing broke, right? It sounds like with Bazel though, it would be like most of that, the input's the same, so I don't need to recompile. Like, is that- just, This is where, um, like, so for this example, like my, web, my Webpack was slow to come up. Well, first of all, the Webpack team is already working on this. And like Webpack 5 is going to have an on-disk cache so that when you restart the Webpack dev server, you're not, you don't get a cold boot. So like, yeah, I mean, like everybody in the ecosystem is working on solving the same problems. It's not like Bazel has the only solution to these problems. So like one answer is, well, yeah, I mean, like Webpack, when, like Webpack is going to improve and like you're not going to wait for cold starts as much. The next part of the answer is, okay, so let's say like we do think like Webpack is doing more work than it should need to do. We have to break it down a little bit and like profile Webpack and say, okay, is the slow step, like in the worst case, the slow step is read the graph of all of my import statements in my code and figure out where to do the code splitting and how to like make the chunks. And if I have the common chunks plug in, then like calculate which chunks are in common between between two like routes, let's say if I'm doing route-based code splitting. That's a global program analysis. Like you change any file, you might have you know, some common chunk that now includes something it didn't before. And if that's the slow step, Bazel doesn't just make that magically faster because a global program analysis still needs to be run and it's going to take the same amount of time. Like Bazel just knows how to run processes. Like it just spawns processes. So it's really, a, the question is you have to like, if you could see the graph of what's happening inside of Webpack, if you could see like the TypeScript compile separate from calculating the chunks, then you would know, okay, like if I'm spending time in something that could be incremental or parallelizable versus I'm spending time in something that like is going to be the same no matter who runs it. Okay, so I always like to hear about the why behind tools and the kind of problem you're solving. Have you had any um, just spectacular horror stories that you feel like Basil's really going to step up to the plate and solve like any just ridiculous build times that you can't even imagine happened? I mean, I, I live in, the, in, a, in a special bubble, uh, like... You know, internally at Google, we've had Bazel since I started. And like, you know, on the Angular project, yeah, like we had we had builds that, um, that took a long time. We've been using Bazel for uh, two years, I think. Like, I think Angular 6 was shipped, like was was built by Bazel, and then we pushed it to NPM from there. Yes, don't name names, but tell us your horror story. Give us a horror story. Don't name names. Anonymity <sighs> matters here, but give us a horror story. I, I like Jen's question. I would love to tell you a great horror story. I'm trying to think of one. I mean, you don't get like people complaining on GitHub being like, oh my gosh, my build time was this. And you're like, okay, well, or you just like blinders, don't don't pay attention. No, I mean, I've talked to some of some Angular customers and they, they tell me like their overall build time is like, you know, we wait 90 minutes to, you know, like build the whole thing or like, you know, how much RAM that needs to go into their build. Um, and I think, yeah, there are some extreme cases like that that sound totally crazy. Here, let me let me tell you this horror story. It's not the one you're looking for. Oh. Imagine, ima- so, so Google has this monorepo. And the monorepo means like everything is compiled from source, right? So if you want to build your Angular app, you first have to build Angular. If you want to build Angular, you first have to build the TypeScript compiler. And like, it goes all the way down. Okay, so here's the horror story. A Googler comes in on their first day and is like, oh, okay, ng new. And then like, let's build the app. And it says like, compiling clang, right? You're compiling the C++ tool. Oh, jeez. And you're like, oh my god! And like, oh, because like you're like, oh my god! I th- like, I I think we compile Node from source in the monorepo, right? Like we have the sources for Node, and obviously, like in order to compile TypeScript, first you need Node, and in order to get Node, you first have to compile it. So the horror story is, yeah, we actually build everything from head, but like, thank goodness there's remote caching because like there's no way anybody would ever do one of these builds, right? Yeah, that would be horrible. Yeah, my horror story was really more like yet another single country project I'm working on. Sorry. Yeah, it was also another, like, hey, Google's really awesome. I mean, yeah. there, there are times that that's ha- handy, right? So, like, we can, like, bring in a node, a new, like, node binary and then test everything and see what breaks because that's cool. all. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, uh, thanks for letting us grill you with questions. I, I, I learned a lot. I feel like I learned a lot. I feel like I'm more well-prepared uh, than I was before the podcast to kind of work with these things. So 
Um, there's many people with questions and they might want to reach out to you. How do people get a hold of you? What's like, what's the best way? What would you prefer the community to reach out to you at? So you can start from basil.ango.io and, you know, read through the resources there. We have, you know, like, obviously, like, I don't have enough time to answer, you know, hundreds of questions a day. So, like, yeah, uh, Gitter, uh, I, don't, I, I don't actually follow Gitter. There, there is a Slack for Basil. So if you start using it, you can, you can go search for Basil Slack. Yo, yo, another Slack, bro. I'm excited. I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> joining up. Yeah. Two hundred megs of, of your memory, you can commit to a chat app. It's good. I'm tr- my goal is to get to a hun- into a hundred Slack organizations. My yeah. goal. Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> Do you want all Joe like my conference Slack so invitations? Much Slack memory that he has to run Slack from a cloud. <laughs> I actually use Basil just for Slack, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basil oh just for Slack, and every time there's a message, it has to go through and figure out. All right. Based on this message, how many instances do we need? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe that's like Basil's new pitch, though. You don't have to close Slack to run it. Yeah. Basil, build your Angular app and chat. <laughs> All right. Clearly, you need to hire us to be the new marketing team. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, now I'm just thinking about like, hey, like, what do the Basil rules look like for building an Electron app? Because so I could actually build Slack itself. But That's funny. There's also devrel at angular.io. Um, so then you can send questions over to, I assume most people listening know Minko Getchev. He's, uh, he's pretty, amazing. Their community. And he's, he's, uh, he's on our team now and he's, he's working. He's, he's, he's the devrel contact for Basil. He answers a lot of stuff too. Cool. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash angular. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. We're going to move on to the pick section. Um... I had a pick. I'm trying. I can't remember my pick. I may go pickless. I think I'm going pickless. Oh wait, no, no, no. Pick here it is. Axe throwing. You have to grow a beard to do it. So that's the one downside. Uh, you don't have to grow a beard. You rent an axe and they they rent you a wooden wall to throw it at. It's pretty amazing. Axe throwing. If you've never done it, it doesn't really feel very. It doesn't sound very social to me. It doesn't feel like inherently a great date activity. I love it. It felt like it was a really fun date activity. It's a real, it's real fun to hang out with your friends too. So it's 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 kind of an all activity. Anyway, just saying. Did you never play throwing. darts at the bar? Yeah, I mean, I've never murdered anyone with a dart though. Well, I mean, <laughs> wait, who did you murder with an axe? <laughs> I've never heard of anyone murdering. I meant, I've never heard of anyone murdering people with darts. Is what I meant. So. Axe is brutal, man. Axe is brutal. So, so yeah. Uh, axe throwing, that's my pick. Jennifer, you want to go next on the, uh, the picks? Oh, gosh. My, my pick is such trash. So, scandalous news broke out in Bachelor Nation yesterday from Reality Steve with uh, one of the contestants having a girlfriend back home the whole time. So, I've just been, like, deep down the Reddit rabbit hole of all the spoilers happening from the season. It's great. So is your your package the um, the bachelor or um, is it having uh, a girlfriend at home while you compete on a sh- dating show which I'm uh, confused. Okay, basically all the drama coming off season basically. The pick is drama. Pick is reality oh. TV is Back channel is, is big awesome making your life better from reality TV. I like and it. And I'm really excited because um at KCVC I'm giving a pub conf talk if choosing a JavaScript framework was well, like an episode of The Bachelorette and I'm doing it on the season of The Bachelorette so I've got primo material to work with. Yeah. It was almost like it was serendipitously planned for you. That's good. That's Maybe awesome. ironic. Joe, you do you have a you have a zip pick? I have got two picks actually. My first pick is soccer. Okay? Yeah. Right now, football. the Women's World Cup. Uh, yeah. Some of the- if you're, yeah, 
Yeah, surprising. Looking into the history of the word soccer is a very interesting thing to do, by the way. But soccer is awesome right now. Football for the outside of the U.S. Right now, it's going on at the Women's World Cup. And what's particularly great about that is the U.S. dominates in women's world soccer. We are, you know, a, a clear, clear, dom- clearly dominant force. We they just trashed Thailand thirteen to nothing. Thailand is. Was great competitors, by the way. But yeah, 13 to nothing, the biggest. 13. 13, the biggest score and biggest gap and biggest shutout ever in World Cup history, in the history of the, of the human race, ever since cavemen started bashing. Uh, How do you feel about football. the pushback against the team for dominating that badly instead of Why like don't you pulling back? Bench uh, well, you can only sub three times. So that's one reason. And they did, they did use all three subs. But to answer Jennifer's question, some of the responses that I heard I thought were really particularly on point. One of the responses was, if this is the men having this conversation, I'm not sure that's true or not because this has never happened with the men because the men are, you know, not that good, right? Like the women are awesome and the men are pretty down, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. Being 30th or 40th in the world is kind of like being last. So... One, we can't know that. We can't know if this would happen, if this happened. Like the biggest, we had an eight to one with Brazil and Germany last World Cup. And like a ton of people lost their jobs, but that's nothing compared to 13 to nothing. The second thing that somebody said, which was uh, then maybe this will be a wake up call to countries around the world to spend more time and energy on their women's soccer programs. Really dig that one, Right. And uh, I do believe in fairness and not running up the score in the non-competitive levels. But when you hit a certain level, I personally am saying, hey, the women deserve to prove how great they are. They absolutely deserve to prove how great they are. And the rest of the world should understand how dominant this particular team at this particular time is. So, Joe, you're, you're comfortable with Michael Jordan and Kobe winning all those championships too then? <laughs> well, wait a second. You We're talking about a different mechanic. Down and is not scored. Come on, Joe. We're talking about a different mechanic here. That's the uh, I'm I'm like stacking a particular team within a market, right? Uh, like, I know. I'm just teasing. I agree with you. I agree. I don't believe LA should ever be allowed to play in any professional sport ever again. Like <laughs> there should not be uh, there. LA should not be able to field professional sports from now on until just the end of time. But. That's a different matter. That's speaking from a small market. Second pick. Second pick. Second pick. Soccer. Second pick is playing Dungeons and Dragons with Aaron Frost. Not just I picked Dungeons and Dragons before, but I'm going to pick playing Dungeons and Dragons with Aaron Frost. We've had such amazing times and such hilarious stuff. And playing without him, he, there's been a few times we've had to play without Aaron, and it's been fun. But he just he adds a really fun element. Aaron is just a really great guy to do just about anything with. But I will say Dungeons and Dragons. I've seen something happen at our table that you could not possibly script, right? Like a writer couldn't come up with so, nothing that Acquisitions Incorporated. Uh, what are the big ones? Uh, the Adventure Zone. And what's the other one? The other big D&D, the, uh, the, all the voice actors and they have the video show. What is that? Nat 20? No, no. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I'm like embarrassed to not know this, but everybody else, everybody's listening to this. It's at all in the D&D is going to be like, dude, it's this and uh, whatever it is. None of them have done anything as amazing as what has happened at our table. I can guarantee it. I will put money on it. You, you, you can't pick something that was as awesome and as funny as what happened to us at the end of our uh, last adventure. So, yeah. So, Jennifer, just to kind of give you insight, I created the I created a character who's the oblivious male in the room, and he does some of the stupidest stuff. Because he's ignorant to like norms and stuff, and he's so fun to play. It's it's so ridiculous that I get to make up a story about what I think the dumb all per, all man is, and he's uh, it's just the funnest character. So yeah. Anyway, thanks, Joe. All right, Alex, do you have any picks? Yeah, I, I can give you a pick. Do you think anybody's still listening at this point? Like you yeah. have to, the soccer, I guess. So we're talking about, about testing and soccer. So if they're still here, they're real fans. Yeah. We can talk real about Jordan Bennington, amazing like rookie goal. He only played half the season, wins the wins the Stanley Cup, you know. Maybe people are still listening because they're driving in their car and they know it's not safe to like 
you know, like unpopular right. pick up their phone. Right. Podcast. Yeah. So for that person, I'm just going to say like, yeah, you're, you're doing the right thing. Keep your hands on the wheel. Don't, uh, don't skip the Thank next you podcast. First. You pick I'm safe not, drivers. I only have 10 more minutes of filler right here before I send you my pick. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I, I would pick, um, I, I wanted to watch some space shows. I was trying to find TV shows to watch, but I have no time for anything. And like, my problem with most TV shows is that they're just like, oh, they have like a secondary plot line and it just takes all this extra time and it's not, it's not dense enough. So I, I found the show Firefly. You guys, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, uh, like, are you I joking? Show, yeah. you like, you found are you spell. joking? And maybe everybody already knows it. But <laughs> oh, sweet. Here. Oh, oh, my bro. God. There, I found this guy you need to read. His name's Shakespeare. I don't know if you've heard of him, bro. <laughs> I got some other things I need to tell you about. Oh, my God. How big is the rock? Here on this movie, Star Wars? Anyway, don't spoil it. It's on the third episode. Oh, God. Uh, no spoilers on Firefly, guys. Oh, God. Be gentle. Yeah. Give, give him some time. Al- I Alex- swear by my pretty floral bonnet, I will end you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Alex, literally, that is, it was the, by far the best sci-fi show to ever be on TV. Absolutely, bar none. I mean, Star Trek's great. Don't whoa, get me whoa, wrong. Whoa, 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 whoa. Have you watched <laughs> The Expanse yet? I have. The and Expanse I will... has the throne, both Firefly and uh, Battlestar Galactica for me. Really? So mm-hmm. I, did, I was not a fan of Battlestar Galactica, far too dark. I don't like shows that are going to, the, 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 the story is around how much bad can we make humans do? Right, and that's the that's the core underlying plot of Battlestar Galactica. But they weren't all humans. They weren't all humans. Well, that's true. But uh, they were. The point was that nobody cared what the Cylons were doing. It was the humans. Like, how can we write a story that shows humans devolving? Right. I'm, I don't know. I, I like the stories that bring humans up. But it's called humanoids. I'm more comfortable okay. with that. Too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Expanse I thought was great. But I just, I really you like that better than uh, Firefly. Yeah, Jennifer? for sure. And like, I am. I was. Diehard Firefly fan. I'm on the fan of. I'm on the fence about Joss Whedon in general right now, but like loved Firefly. But for like a truly, to its core, good sci-fi show because like Firefly is like space fi- pirates and good and happiness and all that is great with the Whedon verse. Space but, cowboys. Like, for, yeah, space. What did I say? You said pirates. Space pirate. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's not wrong. You're not wrong, but yeah. Did you see Castle? Did you watch Castle? I did not. Oh, there's there's like, like three payoffs after. So wait, Alex, wait, wait. No, I did see the episode where he dresses up as a space oh, cowboy okay. for Halloween. Is that what you're gonna say? So <laughs> there's a few others, but Ugh. my favorite about this pick is that Alex was like, I, I don't know if they've ever heard of it. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna say it, and hopefully someone knows. It hopefully it's not too obscure, <laughs> and then everyone who's listening is like, Yeah, yeah, yeah oh my god, you know, yeah. Okay, Alex, problem. though, once you finish Firefly, you have to go watch Dr. Horrible. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm Dr. making Horrible. a note. And Castle. You should watch Castle. That's a good one, too. But I'm so excited, Alex, that you have discovered Firefly and, you know, organically. Uh-huh. I'm so excited that you've discovered remote build execution, Joe. <laughs> oh, I, I would not say that I have discovered that, to be honest. I'm going to say I, somebody told me about it. It's like, it's like hearing that Firefly is a thing. No, no, no. You discovered it. I have... I'm just like, yeah, it's a thing. I've heard about it. Someday I'll be cool enough to be involved. But you are now joining the this really awesome Firefly Club, and I feel I feel privileged, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, I Alex, think I, Alex Evil joined my club. That's that's big. Evil. Yeah. Well, hey, um, I'm gonna cut this off. It's it's, it's we're an uh, hour and fifteen, so I'm gonna end this. But Alex, you are a gracious guest. Thank you for coming on. Oh my uh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Thanks for Jennifer listening. Joe. This was like a super awesome episode. This is this is going down, you know, top one of my top ones. I liked this one. Not just for the ending, not just for the discussion about the picks. Okay, everybody, thanks for coming. We'll check you next time. Peace. Peace. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.